Attention! This makes absolutely no sense. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Sanders Facts. To start the podcast off, I wanted to read what was included in this Sunday morning's edition of Xander's Weekend Facts regarding the shooting that happened at an elementary school in Uvalde, Texas last week. 21 people killed, 19 children killed. And I wanted to just share my thoughts on the podcast to begin episode 65. Enough of your thoughts and prayers. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, Santa Fe High School, Columbine High School, Sandy Hook Elementary School, just a couple of the over 98,000 ordinary public schools in the United States. But you instantly recognized every one of them when I said those words. Why? Perhaps because these are the sites where innocent American children have died due to senseless gun violence. Add Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas to that list. On Tuesday, May 24th, in the middle of the day, an 18-year-old high school student shot and killed 21 people, 19 children included, inside that elementary school. 17 more individuals were wounded. Add Robb Elementary School to the list of deadly school shootings that have occurred in the United States of America, a list too long to effectively summarize quantitatively and emotionally. Add Robb Elementary School to the list of mass shootings that have occurred in the United States of America, Another list too long to effectively summarize quantitatively and emotionally. 21 lives lost in Uvalde, Texas. 17 lives lost in Parkland, Florida. 33 lives lost in Blacksburg, Virginia. There's another one, Virginia Tech. 27 lives lost in Newtown, Connecticut. With details still rolling in, the situation in Uvalde is made worse and worse. In the hours after the first reports, the death toll seemed to keep growing. In the days that have followed, we have discovered that the shooter began his rampage by shooting his grandmother in the forehead after an argument. She ultimately survived. The shooter then drove his grandmother's car to Robb Elementary School, crashed the car, and fired his AR-15 style rifle for nearly 12 minutes outside the building. He then entered the building and remained for the next hour while police failed to engage. He was eventually shot and killed by U.S. Border Patrol. The police response, or lack thereof, to the situation has led to another level of aggravation in an already tense heightened period. The shooter was in the building alive for up to an hour? What were police waiting for? Why were police more focused on stopping parents from obtaining their children instead of stopping the active shooter? Were police scared of a lone individual with an AR-15 style rifle? The answer appears to be yes, since it took a U.S. Border Patrol agent to finally end the situation but not before 21 people lost their lives. The more that's being learned, the more that a lack of competence is being found in the leaders that the Uvalde community was supposed to trust. But remember, we are talking about the state of Texas, the state whose governor, Greg Abbott, has pushed and now signed into law bills that have loosened gun restrictions in Texas. This is the same man who proudly declared Texas a, quote, Second Amendment sanctuary state, unquote, when he signed those bills in 2021 two years after 23 people were killed in a shooting at an El Paso Walmart. The same man who in 2015 tweeted, quote, I'm embarrassed. Texas, number two in nation for new gun purchases behind California. Let's pick up the pace, Texans, at NRA, unquote. The same man who signed a bill outlawing abortions after six weeks in Texas with no exceptions for rape or incest and responded when asked about criticism of the bill, quote, Rape is a crime, and Texas will work tirelessly that we eliminate all rapists from the streets of Texas by aggressively going out and arresting them and prosecuting them and getting them off the streets, unquote. So, like, were you not doing that before? On Wednesday, Texas officials held a press conference to discuss the tragedy. The elected officials that took part included Abbott, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, who suggested seniors should risk their lives in March of 2020 in order to reopen the economy during COVID lockdowns, Uvalde Mayor Don McLaughlin, who has appeared on Fox News numerous times to decry the Biden administration, and Senator Ted Cruz, self-explanatory, among other Texas Republicans. There was one moment in that press conference that ignited a fury among the Republicans on stage, but it had nothing to do with any of the 19 children and two adults that had died. It occurred when Texas Democratic gubernatorial candidate Beto O'Rourke interrupted the press conference that was airing on national television. As the officials were yelling at O'Rourke to leave, 
they were showing the most emotion any of them had expressed publicly in the 24 hours since the shooting had occurred. A funny thing, isn't it? When the head basketball coach of the Golden State Warriors shows more emotion than any Republican on the issue of gun violence, there may just be something wrong. I'm not going to talk about basketball. Nothing's uh, happened with our team in the last six hours. We're going to start the same way tonight. Um, any basketball questions uh, don't matter. Um, since we left shoot around, 14 children were killed 400 miles from here. And a, and a teacher. And in the last 10 days, we've had elderly black people killed in a supermarket in Buffalo. We've had Asian churchgoers killed in Southern California. And now we have children murdered at school. When are we going to do something? I'm tired. I'm, I'm so tired of getting up here and offering condolences to, to the devastated families that are out there. I'm so tired of the, excuse me, I'm sorry. I'm tired of the moments of silence. Enough. There's 50 senators right now who refuse to vote on H.R. 8, which is a background check rule that the House passed a couple of years ago. It's been sitting there for two years. And there's a reason they won't vote on it, to hold on to power. So I ask you, Mitch McConnell, I ask all of you senators who refuse to do anything about the violence and school shootings and supermarket shootings, I ask you, are you going to put your own desire for power ahead of the lives of our children and our elderly and our churchgoers? Because that's what it looks like. It's what we do every week. So I'm fed up. I've had enough. We're going to play the game tonight, but I want every person here, every person listening to this to think about your own child or grandchild or mother or father or sister, brother. How would you feel if this happened to you today? We can't get numb to this. We can't sit here and just read about it and go, well, let's have a moment of silence. Yeah, go Dubs, you know, come on Mavs, let's go. That's what we're going to do. We're going to go play a basketball game. And, and 50 senators in Washington are going to hold us hostage. Do you realize that 90% of Americans, regardless of political party, want background check, universal background check? 90% of us, we are being held hostage by 50 senators in Washington who refuse to even put it to a vote, despite what we, the American people, want. They won't vote on it because they want to hold on to their own power. It's pathetic. I've had enough. After O'Rourke left the building the press conference was being held in, he addressed reporters located outside. O'Rourke proposed four simple solutions to combat the onslaught of mass shootings Texas and the United States are facing. Stop selling AR-15s, the gun that the shooter used, have universal background checks, red flag laws or extreme risk protection orders, and safe storage laws. Actual solutions that would work to eliminate weapons from dangerous individuals. What have those Texas Republicans on that stage proposed? Any proposals restricting access to guns? Nope. Cruz was asked by the UK's Sky News if now was the time to reform gun laws. His answer attacked the interviewer for going into the topic and denied that gun control bills proposed by Democrats would have stopped the shooting. Instead, Cruz has claimed that only having one door into and out of the school is the solution. But hey, at least he's actually in Texas and not in Cancun this time. Most of the focus from Republicans has gone towards school safety and mental health. Republicans are now trying to put more guns in the classroom by pushing to arm teachers. In regards to mental health, Abbott said in that Wednesday press conference that mental health was to blame for the Uvalde shooting. Republicans are arguing that mental health is the main cause of the Uvalde and other mass shootings, that guns are not the root cause of mass shootings in the United States. They're wrong. Yes, mental health is a serious issue in this country that needs to be addressed. But if Republicans actually cared about mental health, why did Abbott sign a bill cutting the state's mental health budget by $211 million this year? If mental health was the true underlying issue, then wouldn't every country be dealing with mass shootings in the same vein as the United States? In 2019, 16.9% of the U.S. population was suffering from a mental health disorder. 
That number was 19.4% in Australia, 15% in Canada, 19% in New Zealand, and 15.1% in the United Kingdom. The United States ranked 13th in mental health disorders in 2019, on par with other first world nations. Mental health issues are not solely an American problem. Mass shootings are. Cruz, Abbott, and others have suggested that the only way to prevent these bad guys with guns are good guys with guns. But there were good guys with guns inside of the school. At least seven officers were inside of the school at the time. 21 lives were still lost. There was an armed security guard at the front of the grocery store in Buffalo. 10 lives were still lost. There was an armed officer at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. 17 lives were still lost. Is the only answer to arm everyone inside of a school? Should teachers be carrying around handguns on their waist while teaching math? The only answer is to make our schools look like war zones? They're pushing for this now in states such as Texas. The results have been a drastic failure, as we just witnessed. There are solutions that work. We know this because the United States of America is the only developed country in the world where this keeps happening. The firearm-related death rate per 100,000 population in 2022 stands at 12.21. In Australia, a 1996 shooting in Port Arthur that left 35 people dead led to a ban on all semi-automatic rifles along with all semi-automatic and pump-action shotguns. Nearly 650,000 firearms were collected in a buyback program, and new restrictions were placed on handguns after a 2002 shooting at a university. A license is also required to use or possess a firearm. So far in 2022, the firearm-related death rate per 100,000 population sits at 1.04. That number was 2.84 in 1996. In Canada, a 2020 shooting in Nova Scotia that left 23 people dead led to a ban on assault-style weapons. Prior to 2020, a law passed in 1995 required individuals to obtain a license in order to buy a gun and required all guns to be registered. Automatic weapons were banned in 1977. In the wake of the Uvalde shooting, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is now promising new gun control measures. The firearm-related death rate per 100,000 population in 2020 is 2.05. In New Zealand, a 2019 shooting at a Christchurch mosque that left 50 people dead led to a ban on the sale of automatic and semi-automatic weapons. The next year, New Zealand banned other weapons, including short semi-automatic rifles, and created a national registry of guns that are bought and sold. A mandatory buyback program collected over 50,000 firearms and over 200,000 gun parts. This year, the firearm-related death rate per 100,000 population stands at 1.07. In the United Kingdom, a 1996 school shooting at Dunblane Primary School that left 17 people dead in Scotland led to a ban on high-caliber pistols. Earlier reforms stemming from the aftermaths of previous mass shootings banned pump-action shotguns, self-loading rifles, fully automatic, and semi-automatic weapons. The United Kingdom is not a gun-free state, as guns are still allowed. However, the measures have lowered the firearm-related death rate per 100,000 population to 0.23 so far this year. In 1996, that number was 0.42. In all four of those countries, assault-style firearms were used in mass shootings. In all four of those countries, assault-style firearms have been heavily regulated and outright banned in some cases. Those were those countries' responses to mass shootings. So why is our response to criticize how many doors are in a school? Why is our response to only blame mental health? Why is our response to berate those seeking change now, saying it's too soon? Those other countries are still dealing with gun violence, but as evidence, at a much lower rate than the United States. Mass shootings have been basically non-existent after major firearm reforms were instituted in those countries. Instead of worrying about their own nations, foreign news outlets now have to cover the carnage taking place in America. A screenshot from BBC.com on Wednesday evening U.S. time showed that two of the top five stories were dedicated to the epidemic of gun violence in the United States. Another screenshot of BBC.com on Saturday morning U.S. time showed that four days after the shooting occurred, it still occupied the top spot on the website of Britain's largest media outlet. World leaders are having to take time out of their schedules to offer condolences to the United States. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky stated, quote, I would like to express my condolences to all of the relatives and family members of the children who were killed in an awful shooting in Texas in a school, unquote. Think about that. 
The president of Ukraine, a country undergoing a major assault on its freedom and independence during an unjustified invasion by dictatorial Russia, has to use up some of his invaluable time to express condolences to those in the United States after a deadly school shooting. Think about that. What does that say about this country? Ted Cruz angrily argued that the United States is, quote, the freest, most prosperous, safest country on earth, unquote. But is it? Heritage's 2022 Index of Economic Freedom found that the United States ranked 25th in the world. The Cato Institute's Human Freedom Index placed the U.S. at 15 in 2021. On the Legatum Prosperity Index, the U.S. placed in 20th last year. On the 2021 Global Peace Index, the U.S. topped out at a whopping 122nd place on the list of most peaceful countries. Now, those rankings certainly aren't bad and are better than most countries, with the notable exception of the Global Peace Index, but they contradict Cruz's claim with data and facts. Clearly, there are countries that are freer, more prosperous, and definitely safer. Australia, Canada, Denmark, Estonia, Finland, Iceland, Ireland, Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom ranked above the United States in all four studies. So why do we allow conservatives to continue parroting these talking points that America is the best and no one beats us? It's clearly not true. The same people that we allow to grasp at straws every time another mass shooting happens in the United States. First, the problem is mental health. Then it's doors and schools. Now it's critical race theory and wokeness. Every time when guns are brought into the discussion, it's quote unquote too soon. Just another deflection away from a losing issue for Republicans. A new CBS News YouGov poll found that 54% of Americans believe gun laws should be stricter than they are now. Only 16% believe they should be less strict. A 2021 Morning Consult poll found that 84% of Americans support universal background checks. A Morning Consult Politico poll released on Thursday showed that 88% of Americans support universal background checks. Also in that poll, 84% support banning sales of firearms to individuals reported as dangerous by mental health providers. 77% support requiring all gun owners to store their firearms in safe storage units. 75% support creating a nationwide database for all gun sales. Finally, 67% support banning assault-style weapons. There are solutions to fix this problem. We have other countries to look at, and the American people are behind these proposals. We should not let soulless organizations such as the National Rifle Association get in the way of actual change that would better our country. The same NRA, mind you, that banned guns from their conference held in Houston this past Friday. Gun control solutions need to be implemented in order to stop the senseless mass shootings we have sadly become accustomed to. The data does not lie. So far this year, 213 mass shootings have occurred in the United States. It is the first day of June. Additionally, 288 school shootings have taken place in the U.S. this year. That is by far the most out of any country in the world. The second highest was Mexico. They had eight. No wonder teachers are leaving the classroom at record levels. They are literally under attack from every angle imaginable. False critical race theory conspiracies, criminally low pay, and school shootings are leading to an exodus of teachers from schools. No wonder students are falling behind in the classroom, and stress levels among children are reaching alarming numbers. They are literally the targets at the ends of high-capacity murder weapons in their own classrooms. Our children are taking time out of their education to practice hiding from school shooters. We have to do this because our children are getting slaughtered in the places they are supposed to be learning. The only thing the children in Uvalde learned on Tuesday is that their elected officials have failed them. We have a choice to make in this country. We can choose to keep our guns that fire hundreds of rounds per minute that have been banned in most of the developed world, or we can choose to spare the lives of innocent children and many other Americans that have been harmed by gun violence. Many Republicans appear to have made their choice. Instead of following them towards more gun violence, now is the time for all of us to make the right choice in this scenario. One the rest of the developed world has already made. If we don't, the U.S. will just continue to slide down the list of peaceful nations. Am I optimistic any necessary change will occur in the near future? Absolutely not. In fact, I'm near certain 
that the cycle we have been a part of for years will only continue. A mass shooting will occur, outrage will ensue, nothing will be done, another mass shooting occurs, repeat. But that doesn't mean we need to stop trying. Change can come slowly, but that doesn't mean it won't come at all. Remember, 21 lives were lost on Tuesday in Evaldi, Texas. Two women lost their lives trying to protect the students for whom they cared for an entire school year. Two families whose lives have been shattered because of America's endless school shooting epidemic. Actually, make that 22 lives lost. The husband of one of the teachers that lost their lives passed away on Thursday of a heart attack just after dropping flowers off at the school. 19 children lost their lives in a place they were supposed to feel safe and secure. 19 families whose lives have forever been altered due to another shooting inside of a school full of young children. Older siblings who will never be able to mentor and play with their siblings again. Younger siblings who are wondering where the siblings they had looked up to for their entire lives have gone. And the worst part about all of this? These lives didn't have to be lost. No life in this country lost to gun violence is necessary, and nearly all of them could have easily been prevented. It's okay to feel sad. It's okay to feel angry. If you don't, you've probably come to the realization that this is going to keep happening, and there's nothing we can do. However, it's time to put all that emotion to good use. No more useless Facebook comments stating, quote, thoughts and prayers, unquote. Enough. How about voting for candidates that will actually enact change once in office? It doesn't matter if it's for your local city, county, or town, your state, or federal office. If there is an election, you need to be voting. In a democracy, our voice can be heard the loudest at the ballot box. Things don't have to be this way. Mass shootings do not have to be the norm in the United States of America. Innocent lives in this country can be saved. All it takes is a voice. Make that voice yours. If you haven't read Xander's Weekend Facts from this past Sunday, I would highly encourage you to do so. There are many external links on there that lead to very important and factual information that I would encourage you to check out that back up the claims in that piece. And this is an extremely important issue. Not just people, but innocent children are dying because of the negligence of this country. The Second Amendment states, quote, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, unquote. Where in that does it say that we have the right to go into a school and fire at innocent children and kill them? Well regulated. That's all we're asking for. That's what I'll leave you with with this topic for today. We will talk about this in the future, of course, on this podcast. And remember to stay tuned to Xander's Weekend Facts every Sunday morning as well. But the podcast is not done. Next up, we move to a more lighthearted topic as our Xander's Facts NBA analyst Hillbilly joins the podcast to preview the NBA Finals, which begin this Thursday. We're going to talk about the Finals. We're going to recap the NBA playoffs that have happened so far as well. So here we go. We are talking NBA basketball as the Xander's Facts podcast continues. Xander's Facts. All right, Xander's Facts episode 65 here on Wednesday, June 1st. And as we continue on the podcast, we are talking about the NBA Finals with, of course, our Xander's Facts NBA analyst, Hillbilly. Hillbilly, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you very much, Xander. So Hillbilly is here to talk about the NBA Finals because those begin on Thursday. The Celtics and the Warriors are the final two teams left in the race to become NBA champions. But the playoffs, we've had three playoff rounds now that have already happened. So Hillbilly, out of all those games, we had 16 teams, 14 have been eliminated, two are left. What is your overall take on the playoffs so far? I think it's been a lot of fun to watch, but I do think that it has been another 
piece of evidence that they need to lower the number of games in the regular season because it seems like once again the champion is determined by who has the fewest injuries and it this season i think this year was worse than any other ones i mean every team i mean the, the number of superstars that we didn't get to see play because of injuries is really kind of staggering and that's not to take anything away from the warriors and the celtics who worked very hard to get here but each one of them they were just healthier than the other teams they played and the warriors were not exactly healthy during the season either no they weren't but they got healthy at the right time and mm -hmm. that seems to be the single biggest factor in whether or not you can win a championship is whether you stay healthy and that's kind of a shame so let's go down here what happened in the nba playoffs so far we had the first round. The Warriors were the three seed in the Western Conference. They took care of the Nuggets, as most people thought, because the Nuggets were ravaged by injuries, even though they have the two-time reigning MVP now, Nikola Jokic. They blew him out four games to one, and then they faced a very young Memphis squad in the second round, who they beat four games to two, and then the Western Conference Finals. So what did you see from the Warriors in their three previous series in the playoffs just overall well you know it's interesting because one of the things that a lot of people are saying is that the warriors just kind of had a super easy ride because of injuries like i just talked about i mean the same thing is true with the celtics but the warriors took care of business they didn't play around they just finished those teams off pretty quickly and the grizzlies they were still a really tough team even without jaw they still their their record without jaw was fantastic uh so they that was still a really tough out and they they took care of business against them and the mavericks it wasn't really injuries they just didn't have anybody other than luca that could really you know compete but you know i think they they just basically showed that they know what it takes to win they're they're not playing around and they're they're ready to go and, and they, they beat, beat the, the Mavericks, Mavericks in five games, games in the Western Conference, Conference Finals. And the Mavericks, Mavericks were the four seed in the, the West, West, so they had to go through the one seed. And, and Hillbilly was actually, actually reminding us, or telling us, before the playoffs, that watch, watch out for, for the Mavericks. Mavericks. And they, they made it to the Western, Western Conference Finals because they beat the Suns in seven games. And the Suns had, they just absolutely collapsed in game seven from the start. They scored, in the first half, 27 points. Yikes! First off, Hillbilly, what do you think happened with the Suns? Like, just a total meltdown at the end of the Mavericks series. Well, you know, both Chris Paul and Devin Booker had horrible games. But I really think that, for, for games seven at least, I think you have to put it on Chris Paul, though. He, he, he was hurt. He couldn't play basketball. He was horrible. And he didn't take himself out. He was too selfish to take himself out. He wanted to be in that moment. And it was bad for the team to do that because he could not play basketball. He knows that he is a big enough name that the coach can't really just take him out. And mm -hmm. I, I think that move, they couldn't even get their offense started. It wasn't really anybody else's fault on that team other than Chris Paul when he's the guy initiating the offense. And when the person who initiates the offense cannot play basketball, you have no chance. And that's what happened. The Mavericks, they were not afraid of them at all. And that's why Luca was smiling the whole game is because he knew that they couldn't get any offense going, and he also knew that he could hunt Chris Paul the entire game, which he did, and he knew that Chris Paul couldn't guard him. And I think it's just, I think it's telling about Chris Paul that, you know, I, I, he should have taken himself out of that game, and he just wouldn't do it. And it's not just Game 7, either. I mean, they were up 3-2 in that series, and he had some terrible games where he scored in the single digits in that series right you know you're right i think game seven was i think by game seven the mavericks had completely figured it out that this guy's not going to take himself out he can't play basketball we will hunt him all game long and make it a little bit hard for him to get the ball up the court and they won't be able to do anything and you know at first blush it, it, it's one of the most surprising results I've, i remember seeing in football i mean it's it was astonishing 
But when you kind of look at it, like it does, it makes sense. If your point guard can't even take the ball up the court, that's what's going to happen. So, of course, the Suns lost to the Mavericks, and then the Mavericks lost to the Warriors. So the Warriors are representing the Western Conference in the NBA Finals, which was sad to both of us because both of us had the Suns going to the Finals out of the West. But let's go to the East right now. The Celtics are representing the Eastern Conference in the Finals because they beat the Brooklyn Nets in probably the most anticipated first-round matchup, but the Celtics swept them four games 2-0, and all of their games were actually, they won by less than 10 points. It was a really close series, even if they swept them. It was. It was was a fun series to watch, too. But, you know, again, unfortunately, the Nets had a max contract player who couldn't play in Ben Simmons. I don't know that that's actually a bad thing. He's a mice with that sick burn. But when you have a max contract slot gone, not playing at all, not represented on the court at all it's really hard to compete especially against a team as good as boston and and kyrie is just doing his thing he he plays some good offense doesn't play any real consistent defense and you kind of got the feeling you could almost see it in kevin durant's face that this just ain't working and the nets and the celtics faced each other in that 2-7 matchup last year the nets were the seven or the two seed the celtics were the seven seed last year and the nets won that series but the Celtics were the two seed this year, and they won that series, and they moved on to face the Milwaukee Bucks, which was a, another really good series, because the Bucks kind of went through the Bulls four games to one, but I think you would agree with me here, Hillbilly, and say that the big factor was Chris Middleton. He wasn't there because he was injured, and I think that if the Bucks had him, I think that the Bucks probably would have won that series. Yeah, I don't think it would have gone to that Game 7. I think there were a few games before that that if they had just had a little bit of offensive firepower. I mean, Drew Holiday had some really good plays, but his shooting percentage was abysmal. He's not consistent offensively. They didn't really have anybody else that could help. Giannis was spectacular. As much as people talked about Jason Tatum, Giannis was clearly the best player in the series. But... He just, he had no help. The Bucks do not, I mean, even before Chris Middleton got injured, there were some problems with the way that roster was constructed. And it was highlighted by Chris Middleton going out and then realizing that they don't have any other consistent scorers on that team other than Giannis. And the Celtics kind of figured that one out. Well, we can let Giannis do his thing and, and we're going to win. And they did. Um, and that's that's kind of on the bucks for not being ready. But again, it's another major injury that basically took a team out of contention. And it, it does say a lot, a lot about Giannis that that series went to seven games and he's the only consistent scorer on the Bucks too. Yeah, like, it really yeah. does. I, I, I think Giannis looked even better than he did last year. Spitting the truth. Like he really kind of had it figured out. But I mean, that's, I mean, you look at the Bucks. you take Giannis off of that team. And I don't know if that team even makes the playoffs in the yeah. East. It's tough. So the Celtics moved on in seven games in the conference semifinals over the Bucks, and they faced the top seed in the East, the Miami Heat, who kind of blew past the Hawks. And then they faced the 76ers in the semifinals, conference semifinals. They beat them in six games, a lot of it probably due to Joel Embiid, who was the best player on that floor getting injured. But they beat them in six games, and they faced the Celtics. Another series for the Celtics that went to seven games. Yeah, yeah, they had back-to-back seven uh, game sevens. And while the one against the Bucks was not particularly competitive, I think the Bucks had basically completely run out of gas at that point. That game against the Heat was very competitive, and it got really competitive at the end there, and was a lot of fun to watch. And I think it probably took a whole lot out of the Celtics. But they did. I mean, that, in, at the end of the day, they did it. I was a little worried. Well, I think at the, with the Heat down two and Jimmy Butler, you know, going down the court and pulling up for three from spot, he made threes in that series and in that game. I mean, if I was a Celtics fan, oh my gosh, when he shot, when he yeah, shot I, I, that's that. The thing, but... I was pulling for the Celtics. Disgusting! Of course. Well, you know. Yeah. I, I can't remember if it was Van Gundy or Jackson that was getting on Butler for taking that shot. 
Mama. I think it was Van Gundy. Mama, there goes that man. But I, I, I couldn't disagree. I think he absolutely won. You want him to take that shot. You want him to be aggressive. You want him to take that shot. I thought he was going to make it. I, I, and I thought that was the end of the game. Because the, he kind of deserved to win that game the way they came back. But it, it, that's the way it, it rolls. He just happened to miss that one. So. Well, he, I mean, he scored 35 points. Like, he's, you could arguably say he's the best player on the floor la- on Sunday night. The Eastern like, yeah. Conference Championship MVP was not Jason Tatum. <laughs> It was definitely Jimmy Butler. I mean, he was clearly the best player out there. I mean, I think part of that is because Jason Tatum had more help, and so he didn't have to push it as much. But what Butler did was just amazing. I mean, they, like, I, I just got done talking about the Bucks not having a consistent score outside of Giannis. The, the exact same thing is true for the Heat outside of Jimmy Butler. I mean, Tyler Hero is supposed to be their consistent scorer, off the bench and he was injured unfortunately and kyle lowry i i guess he's still injured or his conditioning is just bad off the injury you know he wasn't really able he hit some big shots but he wasn't really able to string together a a consistent offense and with all that they still managed to take the the celtics right to the wire which is really really impressive so the heat definitely did not have the same amount of talent that the celtics did but they still brought it to seven games Jimmy Butler, Eastern Conference Finals MVP. But of course, they had to give it to Jason Tatum because the Celtics won. And Tatum played well, too. He did, but I think they, they had, well, I, I think that some of the problems that they had in that series are going to hurt them against the Warriors. And, you know, when, because you know, the Heat were consistently double teaming Tatum. And in, in not only double teaming him, but they would have a third guy shading over and, and basically staring at him the whole time. The Celtics didn't take advantage of that. They should have. Their passes out of the double team, it looked like Tatum was surprised he was being double teamed every time. And he didn't know where to go with it. And, you know, when a team double teams that hard, it's usually a really drastic a sign that there's something really wrong because you're leaving somebody wide open and it, it just a good offense can take advantage of that and the celtics really kind of didn't i mean their offense did not look like it had a good flow during that game during game seven and i think some of that is on tatum for not expecting that double team to pop i mean some of the times he did a good job but not not really enough i don't fault him like in i think in game six he only shot 12 times you know, it's like Jason Tatum is your superstar and he's only shooting the ball 12 times. Well, if that's because he's being double teamed and he's doing the smart thing and passing out of it, he should be getting better results from that. Then. And I think that's Jason Tatum being, what, 24 years old and yeah. still kind of learning, you know, how, how to deal with that. Yeah, we have to remember he is 24 years old. We are going to preview the NBA Finals in just a second, the Warriors and the Celtics. I did want to say, though, you know, Boston did have those two Game 7s in back-to-back series, but their Game 7 against the Bucks was at home. This one was on the road, and you know, in the series, I think five of the seven times the road team won. Boston won in that road Game 7. They are 5-4 and four all-time in road Game 7s, the only franchise that has a winning record in those games. And this was the first time that Miami had gotten to the conference finals and lost under their head coach, Eric Spolstra. And the Celtics also did not trail the entire time in that Game 7. They are only one of three teams to do that, including the Mavericks against the Suns earlier in the playoffs, and in 2009, the Lakers against the Rockets in the conference semifinals. That's a fact! But we've recapped the playoffs so far. Let's get to the NBA Finals, our NBA Finals preview. The Finals is returning to its regular place on the calendar in June for the first time in three years, which was also the last time that the Warriors were in the playoffs. But we've got the Celtics and the Warriors, Hillbilly. So what are you looking at for this upcoming matchup? Well, you know, I'm, I'm interested to see how much of an effect some things like the, the, the amount of, or the, the number of minutes played by the Celtics and how exhausted I think they must be versus the Warriors. They do get a few days off, but... Boston just got done with some really difficult series. 
And they looked like they were kind of out of gas at the end. I mean, there were a lot of front rimming shots out there. I think Marcus Smart missed like his last six shots. And most of them were hitting the front of the rim, which means your legs are tired. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out. But they also, they just have very different styles of play. I mean, Boston, to almost, I would say, to a fault, they do not play hero ball. You know, Jason Tatum doesn't force it. Like we talked about, he only took 12 shots in game six. They try to play more of a team-oriented, you know, game. Whereas the Warriors, I mean, Curry can kind of take a game over a little bit more and is a little more used to doing that. And I was really worried that Tatum's lack of, well, I mean, part of one of the problems that you have with playing that, you know, extremely team oriented game versus hero ball is that it can kind of stifle aggression a little bit. You know, when you just don't have someone doing what Jimmy Butler was doing, saying, I'm just going to beat them all by myself, you know, and I am taking the ball, I'm taking the shot. Tatum looked very hesitant at times because he just was trying to figure out how to handle those double teams, whereas I don't think Golden State's going to have that issue. So it's going to be really interesting to see how those things play out. And experience versus, I mean, this is the Boston's first time in the finals since 2008, whereas Golden State, you know, all those players are used to being in the finals. So it'll be interesting to see the, the experience kind of play its way out, too. And we saw this last year as well. None of the players on the Bucks last year had made the finals. None of the players on the Celtics roster have made the finals. And the Warriors have 123 finals games between all the players on their roster. Of course, a bunch of them are probably Steph, Clay, Draymond, and all the others who have been a part Those of are the, the important le- ones. <laughs> yeah, because they've been to the last six finals in the last eight years but as you said the celtics they have not made the finals since 2008 which was their last nba championship and of course they've got 17 of those but only one in this century and the warriors they've won six championships including three in this century all with steph clay and draymond but what you said about rest so boston now has more than two days of rest now because they've got monday tuesday wednesday until Thursday's game. This is the first time that they've got two or more days of rest between games since May 3rd through 7th, which was at the beginning of the Bucks series. And the Warriors had a week off in between the last Western Conference Final and the Finals game. So that's probably going to play, at least in Game 1, might play a role. And actually, in Game 1, it's going to be in San Francisco for the Warriors The Warriors have won 13 consecutive game ones at home. Too many facts. And they're, you know, the the Warriors are kind of fabled for having a really strong home court advantage. And after, you know, they they used to play in Oracle Arena where it was really bad and hard for visiting teams. And that seems to have carried over to their new venue. So I, I, you know, where we saw home court advantage not matter much, you know, in the last series that the Celtics played, I think it's going to matter a lot in this one. I think something that's also going to matter for especially the Warriors is definitely scoring, but scoring in transition, because I think one of the, like, I watched Game 7 without my phone, without my computer on, just watched it for, like, one of the only games this season. And Miami had its most success scoring the ball, I think, in transition, when Boston was not able to get their defense set, because Boston has the second-best defensive rating in the playoffs. The Bucks were actually first, but their defensive rating is second-best in the playoffs the Warriors offensive rating is best in the playoffs but something's got to give but when you have Steph Curry and Clay who can just shoot in a millisecond I think that could definitely hurt Boston of course there are nights when Steph and Clay are off but when they're not I think that's going to be an issue when it doesn't happen very often where they're both off yeah. And it's also not just them anymore. Poole is legit. He, he's, he is a star. And then you've got other guys like Andrew Wiggins that, you know, is, is a good spot-up three-point shooter, can get some putbacks. Yeah, they've, they've got a lot. And see, that's something Miami doesn't really have. They have Hero and Robinson. Duncan Robinson was benched in, like, the whole entire Eastern Conference Finals because he couldn't make a shot. Well, and he can't ju- play defense either. I mean, he tries, but he, he can be taken advantage of. Yeah, and I think and I think that's something that is going to hurt Boston because they have not 
seen that yet in the playoffs. Yeah, I I agree. I mean, I think it, there's there is a lot that is shaping up to be really difficult for Boston in this series. You know, we talked about you know how tired they may be. They got they they have about seven really good players, but they don't have a lot more than that. Golden State has about twelve guys that can play in an NBA game, and it's really important you know golden state played two fewer games in the playoffs so far than boston two playoff games is a big deal you know that's a lot of mileage yeah and the thing with that is boston's number is low because they had that sweep in the first round those last two series have been seven games that that's right i mean ever since that that series it has been an absolute grind so but the thing is not only have they played more games but they've played so many more minutes per game jason tatum is playing 41 minutes a game in the playoffs steph curry is playing 33 minutes a game these are facts that is a huge difference and i mean that's the kind of like curry can go relax on the bench and pool's got it you know, it's yeah. it's fine. It's not that big a deal. If it's a blowout, or if it's one of those like games where you're up by like twenty in the third quarter, Jason Tatum has to stay in to keep that lead. Curry can go set, and he's fine. And then and then if it starts to get close, he can come back in. But it won't. Pool is is just actually that good. So and it's not just you know Curry. Like Clay Thompson has played the most minutes for Golden State, and that's only thirty five. Jalen Brown's played 38 minutes a game. Marcus Smart's at 36. Al Horford's at 37. Like, all five of their starters play significantly more minutes than anybody on Golden State. Mm -hmm. And then you add to that the two extra games, and I think that is the kind of thing that can really make a big difference if it goes to Game 7, who's going to be fresh and who's not. Yeah, and... I know we have been ragging on Boston a little bit in this series, so, so I will just say, you know, Boston's defensive rating is second best in the playoffs for a reason. I mean, especially a guy like Grant Williams, a guy like Al Horford inside, who really bossed Miami inside. And, you know, if it does get down to the Warriors are not in transition, time is winding down on the shot clock, that's where Boston is at their best of defense. It's probably going to happen less in this series than it did for the heat in that series but when that happens the celtics i think have a clear advantage there yeah they first of all golden state is not a bad defensive team no that's yeah uh, that's definitely that's that's the thing that is always forgotten about golden state is that even during the heyday of the splash brothers era their defense was always one of the very best in the league and, you know, this year, you know, when you look at defensive ratings, you got to remember that Golden State is playing at a faster pace than Boston is. They're, they're higher scoring games. Field goal percentage wise, Boston's number two in field goal percentage allowed at, at 43.3%. The number three team is Golden State at 44.1. They're right there. And field goal percentage is one of the most important statistics you can look at for defensive ability. I mean, they've they're really good at it at at defense. They've got some very good defenders. One of the issues that Boston has is that Jason Tatum as good as he is, and one of the reasons he is so awesome is cuz he's such a good two-way player. But Boston needs him to be a two-way player. They need him to be dominant defensively. Golden State doesn't need Steph Curry to be dominant defensively. That's what they have Wiggins for. If, if Iguodala could play, that's what they'd have him for. That's what they have Draymond Green for. They don't, you know, they they don't need Curry can just kind of keep his energy for the defensive end. That's another big advantage that Golden State has here is that they have guys that really don't need to go too crazy. They can put Curry on Marcus Smart and not worry about Marcus Smart just blowing them up. Boston has to put Jason Tatum on a big time score. It just it doesn't work the other way. The other thing is, is that Golden State's also really good at stealing the ball. And the Celtics can't dribble. They don't have a player on that team that can dribble the basketball. Jalen Brown, Oladipo was just taking the ball from Jalen Brown anytime he wanted to. Marcus Smart has had serious problems with ball control throughout the series. And that's another thing that I think is going to really hurt the Celtics but well I think I heard this said that 
a lot of Boston's issues on offense in the Heat series, they scored less than 100 points a couple times, was they don't have a true point guard. And I guess Smart will play in that role sometimes. And you've got Derek White, but Derek White on a championship team can't really be your point guard. No, and he's just not the, that kind of playmaker. And that's why, you know, the Heat and Celtics were an interesting matchup because you had two teams that had the same fault. Neither one of them were a good half court team offensively. They they both lived and died in the transition game, and they I think the Celtics got kind of used to playing that way and not you know realizing like if we can just get set on our defense we're fine. Golden State is different. They have playmakers that can break down a set defense. That's going to be that, that again is going to be difficult for Boston. The thing, the other side of that though is, is that Golden State is as great as Steph Curry's handle is. He does more dumb stuff with that basketball sometimes where you just scratch your head. And if he does that stuff against Boston, they will take advantage of it big time. And I think that's where Boston could have a significant advantage. So you so you mentioned Andre Iguodala, former Finals MVP for the Warriors. He's been out for the playoffs though. With a neck injury, the Warriors have three guys on the injury list. Otto Porter Jr., who has not played in three games, and Gary Payton II, who's been out since the second round with that injury he had after Dylan Brooks took him down with that flagrant foul in the conference semifinals. But I was reading a NBA Finals preview. ESPN listed Gary Payton II as the difference maker for the Warriors. What can Gary Payton do for them? Well, again, Gary Payton can come in, and he, he's Gary Payton is amazing defensively. If he got more minutes, he would make the All NBA defensive team every year. He just doesn't get enough minutes to do it because his offensive game is basically cuts and stuff around the rim. He he does not have much of an outside game. But what you can do with him though is when you've got somebody running really hot on Boston, you can sick Gary Payton on him, and then again. Steph Curry doesn't have to do that work. He can bring in somebody to do it for him. And Clay Thompson, who looked really good in that last game for the Warriors, he he looked like he may be back offensively, is still a little bit limited defensively as he recovers from those injuries. So it's really helpful to have someone like Gary Payton because when you put them next to Wiggins, and Wiggins is a phenomenal defender, and then you've got Draymond. You've got these three defensive studs there that are about as good as what Boston does defensively, or at least it's it's closer than people give them credit for. And for the Celtics, they're in, they don't really have any notable injuries. Sam Hauser was out for Game 7. He probably wasn't going to play anyway. So, with all that out of the way, let's get down to our predictions for this Finals matchup. So first off, Vegas has got the Warriors favored. They're listed at minus 160. So the Warriors are favored to win this series. Game one of the finals tips off on Thursday night. Here comes a fact. So Hillbilly, who you got, Celtics or Warriors? I think they, with all that we've talked about, I think it is difficult to pick against <laughs> the Warriors. They're just, they've done it before. The only team that's beaten them in the finals was when they lost two out of their three best players during the series when they lost Durant and Clay Thompson and the, the Raptors were able to beat them. And now they are so deep and they have so many different things that looks that they can throw at you. It is hard to pick against the Warriors, especially given how much fresher they're going to be or how much more fresh they, they should be. Whereas I think the Celtics are going to be tired and I don't know how much I like the matchup for the Celtics anyways, but I will say this, you know, Steve Kerr took over for the Warriors in 2014. And he has a winning record against every single team in the NBA, except for the Boston Celtics. It's the truth. And I think that there is something to that. I think that when you have those kinds of wing defenders that the Celtics have in Brown and Tatum and Smart is really almost plays more like a wing than a guard, you can really, really frustrate some teams. I just don't think it's going to be enough, though. I think the Warriors are going to be too tough. I think they're going to win it in six. I actually, I also think they're going to win it in six. I put this here, but I mean, when I look at the Warriors, I just think they are 
t- as close to a complete team as you can get right now in the league. And that's without guys like James Wiseman and Jonathan Kuminga, who looks like he's going to be really good, not even playing right now for mu- for many minutes. I think they're going to win in six games because I think the Celtics are going to give them defensive trouble sometimes. There's going to be one or two games where Curry is not firing and the Celtics defense is swarming. There will be a couple games where Curry is really loose with his handle. They're just not focusing on what they're doing. I mean, we saw some embarrassing games from Golden State, you know, where Draymond's actually hooting and hollering with the opposing crowd in Memphis as they're getting their butts kicked because they just, they, they weren't focusing that game. So I, I you know, I, I think the Celtics are definitely going to take a couple games. Yeah. And especially with the talent the Celtics have and how they can, you know, stop Golden State on defense if Golden State is not focusing and having a bad night. So I've got Warriors in six as well. All right, Hillbilly. So NBA Finals, now we got our picks. Warriors in six. Actually, this would be the seventh championship for the Warriors. They're fourth this century. They're fourth with their current squad. So there are there you go, our NBA Finals preview here on the Xander's Facts podcast with our NBA analyst, Hillbilly. Hillbilly, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Xander. Xander's Facts. Thanks once again to Hillbilly for coming on the podcast. And that's all I got for episode 65 of the Xander's Facts podcast. Thank you all for listening. And remember, if you liked all the facts on this week's edition of the podcast, remember to follow this podcast, download this episode of the podcast, episode 65, rate the podcast, review the podcast, go on all your socials, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Xander's Facts, that's Xander with a Z, And most importantly, tell all your friends, spread the facts, Xander's Facts Podcast. And remember, you can get all the Xander's Facts links on our Xander's Facts link tree, which is linked in this episode's description below. Check that out. It has got the link to the YouTube channel, Xander's Facts YouTube channel, which has got all the new podcasts out with a nice background so you can watch and listen. And Xander's Weekend Facts from Substack. You can click the special link on this episode's description or on our Xander's Facts link tree to sign up for Xander's Weekend Facts. Get it in your email inbox every Sunday morning. It is free and pretty cool. Check it out. So that's all I got for episode 65. There will not be a new episode of the podcast next week. We're going to have a Xander's Facts flashback on the feed next week and a little bit of an update. NBA Finals are going on, so we'll do that next week. And then in two weeks, we'll have a full new episode of the podcast. Who knows what we're going to talk about? Talk about something important. So you're going to want to listen to episode 66 in two weeks. Xander's Facts flashback next week. But that is it. That is a wrap on episode 65 of the Xander's Facts podcast. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you all with episode 66 in two weeks.